says, then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, I saw one like the son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. So we're looking today at the subject of King Jesus. I'll refer also to a, a few verses uh, earlier in that same text where John makes this statement, I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom. So John was writing from what we will call today a kingdom perspective. And that is what that golden sash across his chest was representing. Jesus was in the robe, which represents his priesthood. And he also has that golden sash across his chest, representing that he is king. And on this Palm Sunday, we look at this subject of Jesus the king. And it's interesting that that is what the accusation was against Jesus as he faced his trial. Uh, the Jews did not want him as their king. The Romans uh, did not want to acknowledge Jesus as king. And Pilate even asked him, are you a king? Jesus says, I am a king but not of this world. Not, my kingdom's not of this world. Uh, Jesus accepted the claim. And of course, this goes back in the history of Scripture as we understand it, uh, all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden when you think about Jesus and embracing this title of king in the realm of humanity, it was really a condensation for him, a lowering of himself as king of all the universe. To be a king of men was not really, in the natural sense, was not what he was after. Adam and Eve had this beautiful relationship with God in the garden. You know, theologians say that they didn't know that they were naked in the garden before sin because they had a covering. It was a covering of glory. But when you think of Jesus coming, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He took upon uh, a human form, and this was a lowering for him. He accepted the role of king but it was really a great humiliation for them. As the story goes on with the nation of Israel, uh, they got to the place at a point in their history where they wanted a king. And the spokesperson for God at that time was the prophet Samuel. And he said, uh, God does not want you to have a king. But yet they pushed their desire on to the prophet and on to God. Um, Instead of looking for God's will, they determined they already knew what was best for them and they stood their ground on that. And the scripture tells us that the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning about a natural king in the flesh and all the problems that would occur with that. Even so, they said, we still want a king. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and will lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. But this was not God's perfect will for them at that time. He gave them a king, the scripture says, because of the hardness of their hearts. In fact, he goes on later to say, I gave you a king and in my fury I took him away. But later God would rise up a king, uh, would raise up a king. A king would rise up 
by the name of David that would be a king after God's own heart. And out of that line, God would bring his son into the world. When Jesus comes on the scene, they're looking for a Messiah. They're looking for a king. But again, they're not really looking for what God has and what God says is best for them. They're looking for a ruler or a king who will come and deliver them from the Roman oppression and someone that would put them back on the proverbial map, so to speak, like it was in the glory days of King David. And they push him to the test, even saying, uh, he calls himself a king, we'll put him on the cross. If he's truly a king, if he's truly the Christ, he'll come off there, off of the cross. So the charge against Jesus was being their king. The Jews said, we don't want him as our king. Pilate says, I've put that on his cross. He's king of the Jews. The scripture says, then the leading priests objected and said to Pilate, change it from king of the Jews to he said he's king of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I've written, I've written. See, the reality was the Jews could not grasp the kingdom that Jesus was bringing to them. That his kingdom was not of this world. And the curse of Judaism to this day was that they could never see beyond the physical. And it's the same curse that is on all natural man is refusing to see beyond my interpretation and my expectation of how God should be running things. His kingdom is a spiritual kingdom and it is a kingdom that he rules from heaven. As he came into Jerusalem that Palm Sunday, they're waving the palms. They're putting the palms before him. They're taking their clothes off and putting them on the, the path before him. And they are magnifying his name and saying, Hosanna in the highest, which means save now, save us, Lord. But their interpretation of salvation and God's salvation did not match. Sometimes we do that in life too, it seems, that we uh, try to box God in a corner. We expect God to operate according to the parameters in which we put him into. We like a savior who saves us according to our terms. As he went into that city that day and they were waving the palms, shouting Hosanna, by Friday they are shouting crucify him. Same bunch of people. Think about it. In the rest of the gospel story, we know from where we're at now is that he rose again on that third day and he ascended into heaven and rules from heaven. The psalmist saw it early on. He said that God, Yahweh, said to Jesus early on before he ever came that this was the prophecy. Sit in my place of honor at my right hand till I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. And that the Lord would extend his powerful kingdom from Jerusalem. I believe that there's a literal fulfillment in that of what happened on the day of Pentecost that from Jerusalem to Samaria to the other most parts of the earth and that his kingdom is still advancing in the realm of the spirit. But if you're just looking for it in the natural, you might miss it. That he rules now from heaven. We are not here today to worship the coming king. We are here today to worship the king who is coming. And there is a real difference in that. 
that he is ruling now from heaven. And as he rules from heaven now and has for the last 2,000 years in this unique way, he is the one who determines his kingdom. He is the one who guarantees his his growth. I wish I could tell you that we can find good enough preachers, that we could sing the right kind of music, that we could have the right kind of programs to guarantee the advancement of the kingdom in this world. But do you know something today? I'll let you in on a little secret that you already know. People are awfully fickle. The same people that will demand this kind of music for a church, this kind of preaching, this kind of pastor, these kind of Bible studies are the same people that will cry crucify him before the week's out. But when a kingdom is a heavenly kingdom, Christ, the heavenly king, is the one who guarantees its growth. He, as king, is the one who chooses who comes into his kingdom. That's why he says, I am the way, the way, not one of many ways, not one option, but the way. That's why he is in the scripture, the door. That's why he is the gate. He is the king who chooses who comes to his kingdom. Of course, the Jews couldn't understand this. One of the brilliant minds of the day was a, a, a Pharisee of Pharisees by the name of Nicodemus. And he came to Jesus by night one time just to try to understand what this crazy rabbi is teaching. And he could not see it because he had was only looking with natural eyes and could not see the kingdom that Jesus was talking about. And Jesus said to this man, you must be born again to see the king, to enter into the kingdom of God. That you were born naturally and in this natural birth, you're in a natural realm and you can observe natural kingdoms. But you have to be reborn from above in order to see into the spiritual realm and observe the kingdom of Christ in the spiritual realm. So the Jews were waving palms on that Palm Sunday, but they were waving them for all the wrong reasons. They were waving palms before him with the expectation that he would use his miraculous power and would drive Rome out and liberate them according to their terms. He came to liberate them, but God comes and liberates on his own terms. Amen, anybody? That's why they're waving palms on Sunday and they're screaming, crucify him, kill him by Friday. Seeing his kingdom and seeing him involves revelation. It involves an uncovering. It involves an unveiling. The veil has to be pulled back of the natural to give us the ability to see into the spiritual. That's what he was really saying there when he was speaking to Nicodemus. When he said, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Greek word that is see there actually means you cannot understand or perceive the things that I'm talking about. That's why you're saying, must I be re return back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. You can't see and understand these things unless the Holy Spirit opens your eyes through the new birth. And through the new birth, you can see that and you can understand it even now. Today, in this service, you can see and understand what millions have not been able to comprehend or see for thousands of years. You can see it today by inviting Christ into your life and being born again and allowing him to open your eyes. In fact, God never promises that you will see it tomorrow he promises you today is the day of salvation. Do you realize that to, you don't have a guarantee of what tomorrow's going to hold? I mean, we make big plans. Anybody got summer plans? Anybody got a vacation planned ahead? James said, boast not about tomorrow. You don't know what a day may bring forth. In fact, James says you ought to say, if the Lord will, I'll do this and I'll do that. 
What am I saying? I'm saying to you that right now in this service, this day, you have an opportunity to receive God's special blessing in your life, to open your eyes, to be able to see the kingdom of God, to enter into the kingdom of God and be in right relationship. I can't guarantee you for that for tomorrow because today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. On the natural front, everybody will see Jesus at one point in time. We either see him through eyes of the spirit, through a spiritual new birth, or we will see him as he comes in his glory in the natural. That's why he says in Revelation 1, 7, look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the earth will mourn for him. Yes, amen. And another place later on, he says, everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and every free person, all hid themselves in caves among the rocks and among the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. And from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the, from the wrath of the lamb, for the great day of wrath has come and who can survive it? What happened on Palm Sunday? What I want to say today that what happened on Palm Sunday is the same thing that continues to happen today. They wanted him, but they wanted him on their own terms. They wanted a Jesus that I can control, not a Jesus who will be Lord. There is a terrible teaching that went through the church for many years about accepting Jesus as your Savior and then sometime later you accept him as your Lord. That is a terrible teaching. He is Lord and he is King. When you accept him, you get the whole thing. Amen, anybody? There is no Jesus on my terms. The Jesus who rides his horse uh, of victory and of conquest into our lives and shoots his arrow into our hearts. He claims us for his kingdom and we, are, we become subjects of his kingdom. You know, I've met people before who said things that when you walk away, you, you, you wonder, you know. I remember one person telling me, uh, I don't pray because I was in a hurry one day and I prayed for God to change the red light and he didn't change it to green for me. That's wanting a Jesus on my terms. Amen? Faith is not a magic wand that we get to whip around. and decide. Faith is a deposit of assurance that God gives us for a situation. The idea that I can do anything, I can be my own God, that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You realize when the devil tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden, he didn't say, eat of this fruit and you'll be like me. He said, eat of this fruit and you shall be as God. The original temptation has never left us. We want a Jesus who will reign according to our terms. They wanted him on their own terms. And when he didn't meet their expectation by the end of the week, they're willing to crucify him. Where do we sit today with that? Are we willing to abandon our lives to his lordship? Are we willing to say, Lord, do with me as you will. All I really want is to know you and to be in right relationship with you. Do we really trust him enough for that? You see, the beautiful secret of submitting to God is that the will of God for your life is the safest and most precious place for you to live in. So why would we not abandon ourselves to the will of God? 
because we're not sure we really want what he might want for us. Am I preaching good yet? Are you thinking at least? This Jesus rides in to our lives as king and he rules from heaven and he will return and he will set the natural part into his order, but he's ruling even now if we can believe and trust him. And he rules in our life. But remember this, entering his kingdom is by invitation only. There will come a time, perhaps in your life, but most certainly in this world, where that door of invitation will be shut. There will come a time when a pastor will give the final altar call that you will hear. There will come a moment in history when you will hear and you will feel the last tug of God on your heart to get right and to live right and to be in right relationship with him. Don't miss that opportunity. As we go into this holy week, let us look for the Christ from heaven. Let us look to be in right relationship with him. Let us respond to his call, whatever that is in our life. I will encourage you with these words. James says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There's not a chance he's ever going to change his nature. What God has for you and your life is good and is perfect. And you can trust his perfect will for your life. You may not understand it and it may not fit the terms and the conditions that you would have desired. But if you will abandon yourself to him, you can trust that it is good and it is perfect. And you'll see that sometime. The invitation to the throne of God is a throne of mercy and of grace to us today. That's why we can approach God's throne with confidence. Every person in here today, under the sound of my voice, I want to encourage you that his throne, his throne is a throne of grace. And that invitation is extended to you through the words of the gospel. And I hope they're piercing your heart today like never before. And that you respond to this invitation to this throne. Because at that throne, you can have confidence that God has mercy and has grace for you. And every need that you might have he has the perfect answer. I'm glad about that. Do you know why? I want to give you one little private prayer secret of Pastor Tom, okay? Some of you already know this, but I'm really not that smart. I expected a few more amens on that one. <laughs> I'm kind of relieved that I didn't get them, Bob. Right? I'm really not smart enough to know what's best for me and for my family and for our church and for our world all the time. Anybody else smart enough to have it all figured out? I am glad today that it's a throne of grace and it's a throne of mercy and I can have confidence to come before him and say, Lord, thy will be done because I know his will is right and is perfect. Can you feel that peace today? in your own heart that God has good for you. He may not change the stoplight for you when you want it, but you can bet. I mean, stop for a moment. Let's just, I'm trying to end this, but I, I hit a snag there, so let me go down this rabbit trail. Would you really want a God that seven billion people could be all praying their own selfish desires to at every moment? Can you imagine the chaos in the universe? Amen, anybody? Is that not the truth? 
I'm glad that God is wiser than I am. I'm glad that God is all-knowing. I'm glad he knows everything that is and could have been and might have been and well, every variation of everything. I'm glad that God can see into the future and can order events the way that they need to go to bring about an ultimate good. I'm glad that I can pray thy will be done and pray it in confidence and know that God's going to release grace and mercy into my lives. Anybody else? I'm glad about that. Otherwise, if I can control God, then guess what? I am my own God. And that's not true worship. So let's go into this holy week with hearts of submission saying, Lord, we trust you to do what is right. My response as a human being is to come to his, to heed his invitation and come to his throne of grace and mercy and receive the help that I need. Because as he rides into this world, we're going to see many things, even in our own world. And you might question what is going on. But let me assure you today, Jesus is ruling and he is ruling king today. He's ruling king, but he's ruling on his terms and according to the wisdom of God. Amen. Would you bow with me? Gracious Father, I pray today that you would take these words that we've proclaimed from your word, that you'll let this message get our attention and refocus us back to lives of consecration dedication, submission to your will and knowing you as our Lord, as King of kings and Lord of lords and knowing that you're ruling even now. Lord, as we bow before you, I pray that you'll open the hearts of those here who may have never responded to the gospel appeal to be born again. To have their eyes open to see you. To have their hearts open to know you. Move by your spirit, we pray, even now in this congregation and those listening in other venues to bring about a true regeneration by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.